Hello and welcome to Building High Performance Cultures, a weekly series where we talk with culturepreneurs from top organizations about how they've built high performance cultures and how they're putting culture at the center of their strategy to drive exceptional performance. I'm Marty Parker, President and CEO of Waterstone Human Capital, and my guest today is the President and CEO of Green Shield Canada, Zahid Salman. Zahid, welcome to Building High Performance Cultures. Thank you for having me today, Marty. Thank you. Well, Zahid, a little bit more about him. Joined Green Shield as uh, President and CEO in 2018, I believe, and he has yeah. over 25 years of industry experience and before joining Green Shield Canada, held a number of senior executive positions at global firms. And in addition to being on Green Shield Canada's board, Zahid has been a director with various other organizations. Now he currently serves on the board of the York Region Children's Aid Society as governance committee chair and the board of the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association. Zahid is an actuary who has earned both Fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries and Fellow of the Society of Actuary designations. And he's also a graduate of the Advanced Management Program, as I am, great program at the Harvard Business School. And of course, under Zahid's leadership, Green Shield Canada won its first Canada's Most Admired Corporate Cultures Award in 2019. Now, Zahid, for people who aren't as familiar with Green Shield Canada, tell us a bit about the organization and about the culture that you've built there. Yeah, happy to do so. So for those who aren't uh, familiar with Green Shield, we're one of Canada's largest health insurers. And our story began over 60 years ago now when our founder, Bill Wilkinson, who was a pharmacist in Windsor, had a young mother walk into a store with a prescription to fill for herself and for her daughter, but she only had the ability to afford one. So this really impacted Bill and his desire to help solve the social issue of affordable access to prescription drugs led to the creation of North America's first prepaid drug plan something many of us enjoy today, and to the 4.3 million Canadians Green Shield now serves. And uh, true to our founding social purpose, we're structured as a not-for-profit social enterprise with our business activities funding the work that we do to advance our social mission, as well as advance the system advocacy work we do, all in the spirit of supporting better health in our local communities. Um, we're very deliberate about culture at Green Shield, and we believe it's a key differentiator for us, both from a business perspective and also from an employee perspective. And our culture is really centered around our social purpose that I mentioned earlier, and this notion of supporting the, the broader good to create better health for all. And that's really a reason I'm told regularly why individuals choose to join our organization and uh, stay with us. Yeah, I'm sure having a purpose like that actually aligns people, especially one that's as noble as that. Now, as, as a leader, and in, in, in this case, the leaders ahead, what, what's your role in helping to grow and sustain the culture? I think, uh, Marty, that all leaders have a role to play in uh, helping to grow and sustain culture, especially as it relates to things like setting the tone and uh, modeling the right behaviors. And culture, I think, has to be a leadership priority. So not just at the executive team, but also the board. And that's something that we try and do regularly. Uh, at Greenshield and that culture is a, is a topic that we, we try and cover as a standing item over the course of our annual board meetings. And for me in particular, you know, joining Greenshield back in 2018, I was the first CEO hired from the outside. So as you could expect, there was naturally some trepidation about would I be seeking to significantly change the culture having not grown up inside it. So uh, fortunately though, for me, I, mean, I was very familiar with Greenshield before having joined and really understood uh, many parts of the culture, but as I became more involved and gained a greater appreciation from the culture, we were very deliberate about making it clear that while we were embarking on a new strategic plan to sustain our success for the future, that we wanted to ensure that in doing so, we really uh, kept the parts of our, our culture that made us such a successful organization for so many years. And rather than changing those elements of success, we really looked to build muscle in potential new areas that we need in the future. But um, we were very clear early on that uh, we weren't seeing a need to make wholesale changes to culture. And, you know, we very much continued to operate in that way during my uh, tenure with the organization. Right. Now, you have a very strong, as, as we referenced, purpose and vision at Green Shield Canada. Why, Zahid, are these important tools and how are they helping you achieve uh, your people and your business goals? Yeah, so our purpose uh, at Green Shield is making it easier for people to live their healthiest lives. And our mission is de delivering meaningful solutions to improve health and well-being. And we were 
uh, very purposeful in choosing those words. Uh, one of the things we tried to do was align ourselves to the broader United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Health and Wellbeing is SDG number three. So um, there as well early on in our strategic planning process, we set out those foundational elements and outlined what we uh, were putting forward as our purpose and our mission. And along with our culture, those things really help guide our priorities and our behaviors as an organization. And in turn, that helps align people to what it is we're trying to achieve. And I think this has an important benefit in regular times, but it's had, I think, an extraordinary benefit in these unusual times we found ourselves in during the pandemic. And I think a really relevant example is just how we've managed to navigate through the current pandemic. We started early on by recognizing that COVID-19 was a health crisis, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So we immediately established the health and well-being of our employees, our clients, and our communities as our top priorities. Um, so it really went back to our purpose and mission uh, in thinking that through. And as a result, despite the business challenges we faced, particularly in the early months of the pandemic, we quickly transitioned 98% of our staff to work from home and committed to no layoffs or workforce reductions. And we continue to abide by that throughout this period. Uh, we provided our clients with the highest level of premium reductions, uh, premium relief, I mean, in the uh, health and dental industry. And we also provided emergency funding to a number of the communities where we uh, operate. And we also staffed a food hotline in, uh, in Windsor in collaboration with the United Way. So staying true to our purpose and mission uh, really helped, in my mind, successfully guide us through uh, the pandemic, we're not done yet, but uh, you know we, we've stayed true to this throughout. And uh, we achieved some good results because of that. So our employee engagement score for last year ended in 90%, which was the highest level we've ever achieved as an organization. And our client satisfaction and retention levels, as well as a number of our other key performance indicators, uh, also did very well. I think it really goes back to we started uh, with this strong focus on our, on our purpose and the health and well-being. Well, started and have continued and aligned. Uh, Absolutely. Drive performance. And, and on that note, Zahid, what, what does high performance look like at Green Shield Canada? Yeah, so it's probably a bit unique for us given we're a social enterprise. So uh, if you think why we exist is this notion of advancing health and well-being in our local community. So our primary performance metrics are based on social impact. And we measure impact in a variety of ways, everything from the level of charitable giving that we do right through to the number of lives that we can measure as being impacted by our granting programs and advocacy work. Um, so then of course though, all the, the funding that we have to advance our social impact priorities comes from the performance of our uh, commercial businesses. So we also have the regular business KPIs that you would expect any insurance company to have things around engagement, client satisfaction, business performance. So essentially when we think about high performance at Greenship, what we're really asking our employees to think about and do is to um, operate with a commercial mindset in order to uh, achieve our desired level of social impact. And the other thing that we uh, really look at when we measure performance is not just the what of performance, but also the how. So we are very deliberate with the behaviors that we've laid out. They're aligned to our uh, purpose and, and mission and our values. And uh, so when we measure people's forms, it's also how did they go about achieving the results that they did? Uh, and I think that's an important thing to tie back the culture around. Well, it is. And you know, the how drives the what, which uh, I talk a lot about in my recent book, The Culturepreneur, it, it is really about the how. And that's, uh, that's something that you've clearly connected well to, to the performance there. You talked just briefly, you mentioned there uh, uh, the behaviors. So what are, talk a little bit about the, the behaviors at Green Shield Canada as a hit. Yeah, so we've got uh, six core behaviors that we, um, you know, speak about and that we measure performance, uh, the how, if you will, with, with our folks. So the, the first of the six is really being purpose-led and we take that very seriously. Again, I think the fact that we're a social enterprise really has that uh, resonate as our top behavior, if you will. So keeping purpose at the forefront of everything that we do, knowing why we exist and where we're going. Then we would have other key behaviors. So we try and be a very client focused organization. So serving our clients with energy and passion is another behavior. Um, teamwork is very critical in how we operate. So being an engaged member of the team, 
uh, and thinking of others, which is something that we have done really well, I think, during the pandemic is, in, is the third behavior. Then we have things that recognize that as we grow and, and progress as an organization, um, things will evolve and we'll have to continue to uh, embrace change. So embracing change and being nimble is another behavior. Thinking commercially and being driven to achieve is our fifth. And our final one is uh, thriving with a growth mindset, because as we aspire to grow our social impact in the future, we'll have to grow our business in order to fund those activities. So those are really the behaviors we have. And uh, we expect those to be modeled, not just at the leadership team level, but as, as appropriately as possible throughout the organization. Again, a focus on the how. Now, one of the challenging hows that we're all dealing with today, both personally and professionally, is this increase I would say both in the awareness, but in the, in the cases of, of mental health. And it's something that's really on the top of all of our minds these days. It's rare that a day goes by where we're not either dealing with it or talking about it. And especially with th these unique uh, stresses and changes that are happening in the workplace and at home, whether there's a difference between those two, I know there is, but the line is certainly blurred these days. So as a leader's ahead, what's your role in supporting these discussions? So maybe I can just start with how I sort of see mental health impacting um, us as both individuals and as uh, employers. And I've spoken a fair bit about this during the pandemic, but I really see, you know, despite the fact that we're in today, this severe third wave of COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout challenges in Canada are having, um, you know, a, a big impact on people. And those are rightly all top of mind. I do also think we need to be prepared for the fourth wave, which is really gonna be the significant rise in chronic mental health conditions. And it's already commenced. We've already seen it uh, start throughout the, the duration of this pandemic thus far. And this fourth wave, I really think Marty is gonna be at a scale none of us can ignore, as it's gonna affect our family, our friends, our coworkers, and likely some of us as well. So within the workplace more specifically, we knew already before the pandemic even that mental health was a rising area of concern because uh, we knew from the statistics that a third of Canadians every year would experience a mental health issue, but two thirds of those people suffering would not seek treatment. And we knew that in the workplace, two thirds of disability claims have mental health as the primary or secondary issue. And we also knew from a diversity perspective that mental health disproportionately affects women and lower income people. And all that we've seen during COVID is an exacerbation of these things through things like uh, the most recent statistics I've seen are that four times as many Canadians now are reporting high levels of anxiety, two times are reporting higher levels of depression. And in, in the workplace surveys, we're being told that almost half of employees are seriously considering leaving their current role with clinical burnout and mental health as the leading drivers. But at the same time, more than half of employers admit that they're doing currently nothing more than they were doing before the pandemic. So within the workplace, I believe it's a necessity for organizations and their leaders to fully support the mental health of their employees. It's not just the right thing to do, but we've seen studies from organizations like Deloitte, like CAMH that show a positive ROI of employers investing in mental health. So it's also the right business thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that you've taken with your team when it comes to supporting employee mental health. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, here too, we might be uniquely positioned because uh, we don't just look at mental health as, uh, as an employer, but we also look at it as a service provider. So it's a core focus of ours from both a, a business perspective and also from a social perspective. We recently acquired um, a company called Inkblot, which is one of Canada's leading, leading digital mental health providers. So really from an employee perspective, we've done a few things during the pandemic. One was um, from the early days, we increased the benefits that we make available to employees to support their, their mental health. And we also um, refreshed our manager training to make sure that managers are better equipped to identify or, and at least have initial discussions with employees to get them to the right uh, support to the best of their abilities. And as well, to avoid being the uh, shoemaker's kids who have no shoes, we've also made available to our employees the types of services that we offer to our clients, which are things like, you know, especially leveraging uh, the prevalent, the increased prevalence now of, of digital health services that have uh, taken hold during the pandemic. We offer our employees, most of whom are now working from home, services like virtual talk therapy, which is a form of video uh, rather than in-person counseling. We provide uh, navigation support to the right counselor using some um, you know, technology and tools that we have. 
And we've also offered online cognitive behavioral therapy, which is all about improving resilience through behavior change. And it's something that employees can do at their own pace from their computer. So these are just the types of services that we offer to our clients and we've also been offering to our employees. And uh, I think it's been helpful. We've seen a very high utilization of these additional mental health supports, particularly during the pandemic. That's, that's phenomenal. I'm so glad I asked that question. You know, I've had some experience uh, with, with family, with CBT, and, and uh, knowing that that, that is a, uh, you know, a real phenomenal but big commitment program to see that you can provide that to your own team members and their families as a benefit, I think is uh, cutting edge, not to mention the, uh, you know, the other things that you're doing, you should be lauded for. And I, I, it, make, it reminds me that we should probably be doing more for, for our people and their families, because you're right. Um, this is a, this is, a, th it's not if, it's when right. that, that this fourth wave, wave uh, kind of happens, but well said. Zahid, what, you know, as you look back now in this last year, 14 months, um, what have you learned most about your culture during this time? You know, um, I think the pandemic has really given us a chance to, to think back to why we exist, right? And the core purpose of Green Shield being advancing our social mission. And um, I think that was sort of brought back to be top of mind during the pandemic, just with that, what I shared earlier on how we responded to it. And I think the resilience of that culture uh, and how it's helped guide us through both uh, challenging times as well as more normal times has really been something we've all been struck by, even new employees who've joined, right? So we've been in this, what, 14 or so months now and work from home. So we've got many new employees who've never actually been inside a Green Shield office or met uh, many of their Green Shield colleagues. In fact, uh, one of the things we joke about is we've got a bunch of people inside now we've never seen what the back of their heads look like. But those same people, Marty, are telling us that they've also sensed this Green Shield culture even though we've been working remotely. And they've sensed it just in terms of how we've been focused on supporting local communities, how we've been focused on taking care of each other, how we've continued to do our best to deliver high service levels to our clients. So they're, they're experiencing this just in a different way, but they're experiencing the same thing that we've always talked about in terms of what our culture is. So that resilience, I think, has really struck me during this period. Mm. Yeah, again, making me think about how resilient we've all had to be uh, we probably become a more resilient society, let alone organizational society. Um, and speaking of kind of some of the challenges and opportunities we've been dealing with, how does equality, diversity, and inclusion and culture tie together? And, and how do you see this as all helping drive performance? Yeah, I think a lot of organizations obviously have been having more conversations about DEI during the the pandemic and with all that's been happening in the communities around us. So I think it's great that those conversations are happening. And, and it's a very personal topic for me, being a racialized immigrant uh, to, to Canada myself. And I think about how my experience and expectations around this topic have, are, are now different in terms of the eyes of my children, right? So when I was growing up, um, really my focus when it came to de and I was representation, right? So I just wanted to be afforded the same opportunities as all other folks. And I didn't want people to necessarily you know, see my, the color of my skin. I just wanted to be afforded those same opportunities and be treated the same as everyone else. But then, uh, you know, oftentimes we learn from our children, particularly as they reach their teenage and later years. And, you know, my kids have a very different expectation. They're like, if you don't see my color, you don't see me. And if you can't see me, there's no way you can include me, whether that inclusion is in the workplace or elsewhere. So when we uh, think about diversity. When I think about diversity, we think uh, about it both from a representation and an inclusion lens. Um, and then from a representation perspective, our workforce is uh, unique in that uh, two thirds of our workforce is female. But yet I still think we have opportunity to have more representation of uh, women at the leadership level. Um, and I think from a board perspective, that's something that we've always uh, strived for. Marty, we have it actually written in our board policies that we must have at least one third gender diversity on our board and we typically operate above that. Recently, we also signed up for the federal government's 50-30 challenge where we want to strive for 50% gender diversity at both the board and uh, senior leadership levels. And we want to have 30% racial and other diversity 
uh, at those levels as well. So we're very much working towards that. And this is all within the spirit of representation. We also though are just as focused on making sure that through that representation, we're also providing greater inclusion. So what can we do from the perspective of our hiring practices, our employment practices, the types of training and development that we offer our folks, uh, the types of advancement opportunities and, and how we allow people to avail themselves of those. So we've hired someone in our team just dedicated on diversity, equity and inclusion. And a big part of their focus is is that inclusion piece to make sure that we're benefiting um, from the diversity of the workforce that we want to build. And then as we do this internally, we also want to do the best that we can as one organization trying to advance DE&I externally as well. So talking about some of our learnings and, and the practices that we're putting in place, but then also using some of our social impact dollars to support uh, DE&I causes. So one way that we have social impact is we partner with community foundations we typically focus on oral health and mental health, but recently we started to also now carve out a, a part of our dollars to focus on uh, DE&I. And, and the way, some ways we did that last year was through these community foundations, we actually have supported four funds who uh, are exclu exclusively focused on advancing diversity initiatives, whether that's around gender, whether that's around indigenous peoples, or uh, BIPOC uh, people more broadly. So trying to also live this externally as well. Now, looking ahead to hit, I don't know, three, four, five years, what do you see as critical to aligning your people to your culture and sustaining this high performance culture you've built at Green Shield Canada? Yeah, Marty, that's a question we actually think about a lot because we've embarked upon uh, this ambitious uh, strategic plan that takes us through 2025. And the main objective of the strategic plan is to, advance, is to expand the financial capacity that we have to deliver even more social impact. But the way we need to go about doing so to get the funding to do just that is to look at our business. And what we decided to do is that uh, we have an opportunity to diversify beyond our core health insurance business and expand into new markets that are mission aligned with things like health and benefits administration, health services delivery, like some of the mental health services I outlined earlier. And to do this, we're gonna have to look at acquisitions. So we have this amazing 63 year plus history now where we never did any acquisitions, we grew entirely organically. But then to advance the diversification strategy, what you've seen in just the last six months is we've closed the first three acquisitions in our company's history. We expect to do more as we continue to grow. But this type of change where we're diversifying into new markets, where we're making acquisitions, obviously this can put culture at risk. So we're being very careful about communicating with our employees throughout the process about why we're doing this, tying it back to our social mission and ensuring that as we proceed, we don't lose those core elements of the structure uh, of our organization, sorry, and culture that have made us so successful. And in fact, when we look at an acquisition, we really start by looking at cultural fit as one of the key elements of deciding, do we want to pursue this or not? So I think having that discipline and, and keeping culture top of mind over the next three to five years as we advance our strategic plan is uh, going to be really critical. Very, very interesting. Now, last question for you, and it's a little bit more of a, a personal one, and that is, what's the one piece of advice, Zahid, that you would give to a young person today, or it could be a new leader, um, who's just starting out on their high-performance culture journey? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a, a one of my favorite books is one called... Um, how will you measure your life? It was actually written by Clayton Christensen, who was one of the professors at that advanced management program that both you and I attended at, at Harvard Business School. And you know, in his book, he speaks about the importance of balancing career, family, friends, and health as part of measuring your life, rather than being too singularly focused on your career. I, you know, I first read this book a few years ago, and uh, I was reminded of many of his lessons most recently during the pandemic. And I really believe that a, a high performance culture journey starts with a good fit between the individual and the values of the organization they work at, as well as a clear understanding of what success looks like. Um, so I would encourage any young person or, 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 or new leader that they should first and foremost seek to be authentic to them, their full selves. Um, and that begins with choosing a career and an organization whose values are aligned with yours. And once you have that basic tenant, I think from there, you're, you've got the platform that you'll need to 
build that high performance journey and make sure culture is a key part of it because people who are working there are aligned with what the broader group is trying to achieve. Oh, that's authenticity as cultures and organizations, both you know, as culture being our brand today and our brand being our culture representing externally, that, that lesson can equally be taken to, to us as individuals to really be authentic. And I actually think that this next couple of generations that we have, that are coming through into the leadership pipeline of gen, you know, millennials in generation Z or Z uh, are, are much better at that than say we may have been. And, and I think uh, that, that they truly want to find purpose and meaning in their work and, uh, and, and truly feel that, that that is an authentic way to be. And I, I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly. Um, and I wanna, I wanna thank you very much. There's been so much um, to take out of our discussion today. I think uh, it's clear uh, that as a social enterprise, you're very purpose-driven, but, uh, but I also think it's clear that you're on the cutting edge of doing a lot of different things uh, that are uh, employee team and culture centric first uh, that that we can all learn from um, and and not to mention that you know uh, you're bettering lives in the process but uh, the 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 idea that uh, a fourth wave is coming and, and getting ahead of it and being supportive and, and possibly even taking advantage of, of the resources and making the investment that Green Shield Canada has I think is not only beneficial for your key stakeholders, like uh, like your customers and your suppliers and your partners, but is going to make a big difference as you acquire and grow and build your own competitive advantage based on your culture. And it's interesting you mentioned Clayton Christensen; he's one of my favorites. We go into a strategic planning session tomorrow, and I was looking through his book that I just have at the corner of my desk on disruptive strategy, yes. where he talks about really putting stakeholders and what you can do for them and they can do for you, making sure you understand your target market. You know, so much of that philosophy on your strategy and your business planning is, is external. Uh, and yet in that book, he talks about ensuring through that, that you don't miss the key stakeholder of your team members. And in fact, that, that he said one day, his exact line in this book, and I'd forgotten it until I just looked at it the other day, one day culture may be the competitive advantage that we're all talking about. Until then, don't miss that as a key stakeholder. And I, honestly, literally, I took my glasses off and went, wow, uh, there's a reason that, uh, that he, he's been you know, such a great expert on so many different things. So I wanna thank, uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. It's been exceptional and we've certainly benefited from it. Thank you, Marty. I enjoyed the discussion a lot. Appreciate your time. Uh, my pleasure. And I'd like you all to consider joining us next week for another episode of Building High Performance Cultures. And in the meantime, if you want to learn more about the topic, please visit waterstonehc.com. If you want to learn more about the culturepreneur and how to lead in a way and put culture at the center of your operating strategy, you can also go to waterstonehc.com. Mm -hmm.